honored guests, distinguished members of the diplomatic corps, elected officials, friends, good evening and welcome. I'm Liebe Geft, I'm the director of the Museum of Tolerance, which is the educational and outreach arm of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, an internationally renowned Jewish human rights organization. The Wiesenthal Center is honored to host this timely event in collaboration with Rally for Her Justice, a grassroots movement to raise awareness, change public attitudes, and influence policy reform in the United States and beyond on the burning issue of unpunished war crimes, especially rape as a weapon of war. I would like to recognize and thank Vera Mieku, devoted New York City public servant, fierce advocate for women's human rights. <laughs> and co-founder of Rally for Her Justice. Thank you, Vera, for your strong partnership and your passionate involvement. We also gratefully acknowledge former council member Mark Jonai for sponsoring this initiative and making this program possible. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Our thanks to the administrators and the wonderful professional team at Roosevelt House, the location of CUNY's public policy department for Hunter College, a historic and meaningful venue for this event. But most especially, we thank all of you. We've come out to discuss something that's not easy to talk about, Thank you for joining us here tonight to address the crucial, painful, difficult issue of sexual violence and rape as a weapon of war. Historically, it is one of the most hidden and heinous of crimes. While these horrors, atrocity crimes, are certainly not new, there is an alarming sense of urgency as global conflicts are proliferating with a concurrent rise in attacks against women. With the help of our distinguished panel and special guests for this forum, our aim is to raise awareness, be better educated and informed about the challenges and the possible solutions, and be inspired to redouble our own commitment to act as individuals and as a nation, to stop the scourge by all means possible hold perpetrators accountable, support the survivors through survivor-centric approaches, and prioritize prevention of sexual violence in conflict. To set the context, we're very pleased to showcase select images from the landmark exhibition, One Person Crying, Women and War, by prize-winning photojournalist and documentary photographer, Marissa Rock. This photographic essay with a global reach takes an unflinching and thought-provoking look at one of the most underreported aspects of conflict and warfare, that of the role of women on the home front and as refugees, and how these consequential experiences irrevocably impact on their post-war lives. It is my very great pleasure to invite Marissa Roth to share some insights on her 37-year odyssey, spanning generations and geography, to personalize the issue through the telling and sensitive lens of her camera. Please welcome Marissa Roth. Good evening. And um, first, uh, first, I would like to thank Liba for inviting me to participate in this event. And she was the one who actually 10 years ago, 11 years ago, came to me and said, I want to host the debut exhibition of One Person Crying Women in War at the museum uh, before a 10-year exhibition on Anne Frank was coming in. And so she was really the inspiration for me to hire a curator and finally put it together. And it then went on to travel to Berlin and France, and, and now it's here. I'm going to read from notes because I don't want to speak too long, so forgive me for not looking up the whole time. Um, 
Like so many people, I have been keeping up with the news and photographic images coming out of the war in Ukraine. In many ways, I see this war as a microcosm of one person crying, women in war. The Ukrainian stories are the same, regardless of time, geography, nationality, ethnicity, culture, and religion. Women are being caught in the crossfire. Women are deliberately being killed in massacres. Women are weeping and burying their loved ones. <coughs> Women are being displaced or forced to become refugees with their children. Women are being raped. Women are courageously remaining at home <coughs> to maintain some semblance of normal life. Women who are picking up arms as civilians are choosing to stay and defend their country. We are witnessing the extraordinary capacity of these women to cope and to resist and to reinvigorate despite the traumas and hardships that they are experiencing and enduring in yet again another war. One Person Crying has taken me on an unexpected journey while bringing me face to face with hundreds of women who also survived wars and conflicts. My aim for this work, first as a photojournalist and now as a documentary photographer, has been to highlight what I consider to be the un un unreported perspective, as Liba stated, the women's side of the story. I chose to address the central themes of how women are directly impacted by the in inevitable immediate and long-term consequences and how they integrate these experiences into their post-war lives. This photographic journey ultimately brought me home to my own family's history, specifically a massacre in Novi Sad, Yugoslavia in 1942 during World War II that took the lives of my paternal grandmother and great-grandmother. What I didn't realize for decades while working on this project was that my inheritance of the Holocaust and its attendant sorrows and residual trauma was and still is a key driver in creating one person crying. Watching the resilience of the Ukrainians and the rapid and strong response from so many countries to support them has been awe-inspiring to see in real time. This unexpected opportunity to view the daily evolution of a war has offered me a rare opportunity to glean important insights into my understanding of other wars and conflicts that are featured in the project and to, and to see how the women were pivotal at every juncture. There are recently reported stories that exemplify hope and inner fortitude, such as the return of the ballet in Lviv two weeks ago and the determination of many Ukrainian mothers who are now coming back with their children from other countries so they can live at home and rebuild their lives even as the war rages on. I believe that we as humans have great depths of strength and courage within us, yet we are not always tested to really know fully our own abilities and possibilities. With the tragic echoes of war continuing to, to resonate from the past into the present, <clears throat> I look towards the future with enduring optimism that there will be alternative ways other than war to access these deeper dimensions within ourselves. So since this is a bit of an abbreviated version of One Person Crying, I thought I would show some image other images from the exhibition and I'll, I'll give a very brief little description. So, Danny, the lights. So, this is a window at my grandmother's home in Novi Sad, Yugoslavia, which I took in 1984. By the way, these are in chronological order as I took them. Um, my grandparents' home after the war was taken over by the local government and is, has been a day, children's daycare center. Um, and we went as a family and gained access. And I took, of course, I took photographs. The next story that I did was in Pakistan uh, during 1988 at the end of the war with the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And these are Afghan refugee women and girls. At the end of the war, uh, there were approximately 100,000 Afghan war widows. And this young girl, I didn't have a translator and I was by myself in the camp and 
something about her just caught me and captivated me. And so she became my mascot throughout the whole project. I always have a portrait of her. And over the years when I thought I was just couldn't go forward with the project, I felt like she was my conscience looking at me and just like, come on, you can do it. Um, Vietnamese boat people in the Philippines, um, after the war in Vietnam ended in 1975, thousands of Vietnamese escaped the repressive communist regime and took rickety boats um, and landed on many shores throughout Southeast Asia. Um, Hiroshima was a story that I had always wanted to do and I went there in 2002 and met this woman, Mishiko Yamaoka, who was terribly burned um, during the war. And in 1952, no uh, Norman Cousins organized a medical airlift for 18 young women known as Hiroshima Maidens and uh, New York City uh, plastic surgeons um, basically helped to rebuild their faces and lives. Uh, this is Hiroshima River. Often I would go, uh, as I was learning about stories, I would piece information together and so everybody ran to the rivers after the A-bomb fell, so I photographed a river. In 2004 and five, I was trying to figure out a way how to address the war in, um, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and went to Columbus, Ohio to meet with mothers who'd lost their sons that summer for in Lima Company. And this is Becky Distant, Dixon, whose son uh, was the youngest Marine killed that year. Um, this is Lori Youngblood with her two children. Her husband, um, Travis, died that summer as well. And she gave birth to their daughter after he, he was killed. Northern Ireland, um, this is Alice McNally, who lives in North Belfast. She has 11 children, and life has been very hard um, during the, what they call the Troubles, which is decades of sectarian violence. Um, again, I tried to take supporting images that also tell the story, and this is Milltown Cemetery, a Catholic cemetery in Belfast. Kathy Weiss is a beloved Holocaust survivor who speaks at the Museum of Tolerance. And um, I have a, a particular place in my heart for Kathy because she came from the same town in what is now Romania as my great grandmother. It's Satumare. So I love Kathy. Um, this is an Auschwitz uh, a window in one of the barracks at Auschwitz. Um, Cambodia, another story that I wanted to address, uh, of course, the Khmer Rouge gen genocide, which took the lives between, uh, of between 1.5 and 2 million Cambodians. Um, and they have pagodas throughout Cambodia with, with some of the victims' bones. Um, Bosnia, Srebrenica, I spent two big trips in Bosnia uh, following the path of the Srebrenica massacre. Um, this is Arifa Osmanovic at, at, in Potokari, which is the cemetery, and uh, she lost her three sons in the Srebrenica massacre. Um, this is a former uh, mass grave site um, with a cornfield growing on it. Vietnam was a place I knew I had to go, um, and as an American, I found it actually was the most wrenching trip that I did. Um, because growing up, I had seen so many images coming out of the Vietnam War, and I think that actually shaped me as a young person and inspired me to become a photojournalist. So as I actually felt terrible guilt when I was there, but I was doing my job. So Agent Orange disease was a story that I, I focused on, um, and this family, so the, the mother on the right, her father was a soldier and had been exposed to Agent Orange. She was born with some Agent Orange disease, but her daughter is severely um, deformed, probably not alive anymore since I photographed her. And the son seemed fine. This is Sarah Blum, who was a nurse, American nurse in a, um, an evacuation hospital for pilots in Cu Chi, Vietnam. She too was exposed to Agent Orange. Um, her children were born with birth defects. And um, she was given a Purple Heart by a group of veterans. Um, 
who basically said, these are for the, the wounds, the unseen wounds that you experienced. Um, the show, the exhibition went to Orador sur Glane, to the Center for Memory. Um, and this Orador was a, a town in Germany uh, that sustained a horrible massacre of 642 people, including women and children, in June 1944. And the women and children were put into the church and shot, and then they burned the church down. So this was the altar. Syria, the war in Syria. Um, so I went to Jordan in uh, December of 2018 and photographed Syrian refugees. So this is Muradeh Hussein Akrajab um, with her children and the children of her sister who died in the war. And this is uh, Ishraga Atta, who actually is a Sudanese refugee who's been living in Jordan for 17 years. So I'm going to wrap it up because I know we're on a tight time schedule. But anyway, thank you all for coming. And um, so. Thank you very much, Marissa. There is nothing more powerful than authentic first person stories to personalize history, build understanding, and create empathy. But recounting a story of humiliation, dehumanization, Degradation, horror, and despair is terribly hard and often culturally taboo and perilous. So in the sick logic of war, rape is a highly effective weapon. Its crippling effects can last for years. By creating shame and humiliation, it destroys ties within the family and communities. It silences and paralyzes. The only shame in rape is committing, commanding, or condoning it. It is not merely an aspiration, but an obligation to bring justice to the victims who bear the brunt of the impunity that has fueled their violators for far too long. To do so, we need documentary evidence, and we are profoundly grateful and indebted to the brave, strong, courageous, resilient women who speak up about their experiences. Vasvie Krasniki Goodman, co-founder of Rally for Her Justice, has set an inspiring example as a leading advocate and activist demanding that women's voices be heard and heeded. I am honored to invite Vasvie Krasniki Goodman to share her story. Thank you, Luiba. Before I start with my remarks, I would like to thank you. Thank Vera Mieko, Mark Jonai, for supporting us, seeking justice, and to end stigma. I apologize to my Albanian people for having to hear my story again, but I have to repeat it in just about every place that I go. The Ukraine war, it's, uh, it shows that the history repeats itself. And if we don't top, uh, put a stop to it, it's going to continue to repeat. And the war in Kosovo, 1999, 19, 1998, 1999, there was over 13,000 people killed, over 1,700 still missing. We have over 1,200 children that have been killed by Serbian forces, and 20,000 men, women, and children raped by Serbians. I'm one of them. And I apologize if I'm emotional, but I don't know if there will ever be a point where I can share my story and not be emotional. I was only a 16-year-old girl when I was abducted from my family's home. I was abducted by a Serbian police officer. He was dressed in a Serbian police officer uniform. And I was taken to a Serbian village. At that time, for an Albanian girl to be abducted and taken to a Serbian village, nothing good was gonna come out of it. I had no idea what was to happen to me. I didn't know if I was gonna be killed, massacred, or what. But I begged him to kill me, because I figured being killed, shot by a bullet, it was the best thing that could ever happen to me that day. But instead, I was raped by a, an officer and a civilian. That destroyed my life, it destroyed my future. To this day with us, it's just about surviving. It's not about following our dreams. 
and I'm one out of 20,000 survivors. All the survivors, they wish they had the support and the courage to share their stories. But because of the stigma that surrounds them in Kosovo, it's very hard for a survivor to come forward. Uh, with that, I've, I've been fighting for justice since 1999, and I never got justice for my case. But I will not stop fighting until the justice is delivered. It's about time that we hold Serbia accountable for all the crimes they have committed. Instead, the democratic nation lets Serbia play as a victim and says our adversary the war. Thank you all for your time. Now I'm going to keep it short. Thank you. Thank you, Vasvier, for your courage, for your leadership, and for your inspiration. Your story matters, your voice is being heard, and we hope and pray that it will allow you one day to dream again, that being a survivor is a badge of honor, and you are our example of resilience and hope and faith. I'm also honored to recognize two other very special guests who flew in from Kosovo. They're also part of the exhibition, One Person Crying, Woman and War. Please welcome Basata Yashara. <laughs> Basata is the daughter of the Yashari family, most emblematic family in Kosovo, considered leaders of the armed resistance against the Serbian president, Slobodan Milosevic, and his regime. On March 5th, in 1998, Basata was only 11 years old when Serbian forces surrounded and attacked the family compound in Prekaz, murdering 58 members of her family. Basata hid behind a wooden box with her wounded sister and pretended to be dead. She is the only survivor of her family. Basata was photographed by Marissa for the exhibition at the family compound on the 24th anniversary of the massacre. Thank you for being here, Basata. <laughs> we are also delighted and honored to welcome Kadire Tahirai, the founder and director of the Center for Promotion of Women's Rights in Vrenas, Kosovo, which has been advocating for the rights of survivors of sexual violence during the war of 1998-1999. The center provides support and services to survivors who still face many challenges during post-conflict transformation. The hundreds of survivor women in her center produce artifacts brooches, necklaces, frames, and other items that we're exhibiting here in conjunction with the photographic exhibition, One Woman Crying, Woman in War. The sale of these meaningful artifacts provides much needed affirmation and financial support to these women. Please see how you can help. Thank you so much, both of you, again, for being here. We are acutely aware that sexual violence continues to occur with every new wave of warfare. It takes many forms, and as Vasvier mentioned, wartime rape affects both men and women. Men can be victims and women can be perpetrators, although gender-based violence most stridently affects women and girls. Under international law, acts of conflict-related sexual violence are characterized as war crimes and crimes against humanity. And when it is committed with the intent to destroy a population, systematic sexual violence can amount to genocide. How can it be stopped? How do we strengthen the capacity of national organizations to protect their populations? and reassure women that they are not forgotten, and international law is not an empty, hollow promise. 
We are fortunate to engage our prestigious panelists to bring unique perspectives, experience, and expertise to this vexing and complex issue. It is my pleasure to invite to the stage Ambassador Ferret Hoja. Please, Ambassador, if I could ask you to take your seat. <laughs> Ambassador Hoja is the permanent representative of Albania to the United Nations, where he has served one third of his long and illustrious career at home and in the Foreign Service, dealing with issues of human rights and criminal accountability. Thank you for being with us. Please welcome Professor Tanya Domi. Tanya. <laughs> professor Domi is an adjunct professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University and is a faculty affiliate of the Harriman Institute. Since 2008, she has taught human rights in the former Soviet Union, human rights in the Western Balkans, and the great powers in the Balkans after the fall of Yugoslavia. Her research focuses on genocide, transitional justice, and the rights of ethnic minorities, women, and LGBTQ community. Thank you, Professor Domi, for joining us this evening. <laughs> I would like to also ask Basvier and Marissa, please, to join us on the panel. And before I take my seat, there is someone very special that I want to recognize and especially welcome, and that is Elliot Engel, former chairman. <laughs> Congressman Engel is the former chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee and member of Congress, who was the first to apply political muscle in amplifying the voices of victims of sexual violence in conflict. Thank you for your leadership. <laughs> Ambassador Hoja, I'd like to begin with you first, if I may. The United Nations, Security Council, the International Criminal Court were all created to prevent violence, to prosecute and punish war criminals, and to promote peace. Where are they? Where do we stand on these issues today, and how relevant are they? Is there any hope that the world can act in solidarity on this issue? Thank you very much for this question, but before I start uh, uh, answering the question, I would like to first of all thank the Centre, thank you, the Museum of Tolerance, thank uh, um, Bradley for her justice, for organising this event, for bringing these stories again, for really making it possible that we can talk about these very painful things. I'm not happy to have to talk, and I wish I had not to listen to your account, Basfia. But that's, those things have happened, those things need to be said, they need to be known. And if I may say, you speak not only on behalf of yourself and your painful story, you speak, you have that silent cry of those 20,000 women, men and girls that had to go through that ordeal. So be proud of what you do and what you may do, because those who cannot, who do not have the courage or the possibility, they would feel what you feel, they would see themselves through your account. So thank you again, and please don't stop, because we need those accounts. <laughs> On this horrible issue, we know wh where we come from. For quite a long time, crimes, horrendous crimes, sexual violence in conflict was not recognized as a crime, a war crime or crime against humanity, as you rightly mentioned even amounting to genocide in specific cases. But in the last 30 years, things have changed, thankfully. So the normative um, acts have improved. There are quite a number of Security Council resolutions and other um, legislative papers which have improved the normative um, uh, practice. But there is one thing that we are missing. We have a lot of papers, we have a lot of framework, but it's extremely difficult to really go through accountability. This is the, the major, so there are two things that are extremely important to work on. First is prevention, so that these things do not happen, and then if they happen, and unfortunately they continue to happen, how to really make sure that we gather evidence, we go through prosecution, we go through accountability, and we, those we go through um, um, we against impunity. It's very difficult to gather evidence, and I'm thankful uh, that the photos of uh, Marisa Roth are also a testimony. Those articles of investigative uh, journalists 
help to really spot, um, um, to, 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 to shed light on what happens, which can help those inquiries, the Commission of Inquiry of Human Rights uh, uh, Council for, for, for Ukraine or other accountability mechanisms. But what we need first to improve prevention and then to, um, to improve um, the um, uh, prosecution and, and accountability. I'd like to say that if we see what has happened in, in Kosovo, and I, I'm from the Balkans, I'm from Albania, and we, we, we live with this uh, painful memory of those 20,000 persons, women, men, and girls that have, uh, have to go through, through those horrible crimes. But we know that a few cases have been processed and some 50 cases all in all are under proce um, uh, proceedings. So how does this happen? It is enraging. And of course, all those who ask the question why we can do more, it is one key issue, how to gather evidence that can be presented to courts. And this is the big challenge of the UN system. This is the big challenge of all the civil society and everybody that's, that, that is included. So this is where we have to work. And I'll, I'll end my remarks with one thing. Albania is in the council since January this year. And the top priority is what we call the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And within Peace and Security Agenda of the Security Council, sexual violence in conflict is one of the key issues. And we have committed to speak out to work, how to improve it, and to make sure that we advance uh, through impl implementation. And we will be organizing specific activities, not just meetings for meetings, but meetings to bring best cases, best practices, be it individual, country specific, or region specific, so that we make sure that what happens, um, what works in one place can be replicated as best in other places. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Hoxha. Thank you. So a, a glimmer, a glimmer of hope of some movement forward. But Professor Damiad, I'd like to follow up on that because the United Nations has one role, but it's not the entire role in terms of global jurisprudence. What are the courts of jurisdiction? And how do we bring all judicial, political, economic, and social forces to bear in seeking redress and justice for survivors of sexual violence? in war and, and the families of the victims? Thank you for this question. I also want to be uh, the Thank you for that question. And I also want to thank uh, the Museum for Tolerance and the Simon Wiesenthal Foundation and Rally for Her Justice, which has really driven uh, this local effort that has become national and international. Uh, to, former con uh, to former city council member Mark Janai, you're the best. We stood together on that stage, <laughs> together in solidarity. And the reason I'm here is because I'm here because of Vasvia and all the survivors from Kosovo, all the survivors who endured and have yet had a day in court for redress redress and to get justice. And so in that regard, one of the things that the ambassador did refer to, yes, there's a great framework through uh, the UN and the, and the UN Security Council and, and the whole architecture around women, peace, and security. And we have a, we have a representative for uh, an S SSRG, rather SRSG, who deals with sexual violence during conflict, and, and sh she is now engaged in a contract with Ukraine. They contract with the country that wants their help. That's a new additional support. But I am sad to say that in this context, with all due respect to the ambassador, and I'm sure he cares a great deal, the UN is perhaps the most irrelevant that it has ever been during this conflict in Ukraine right now. It makes me very, very sad to see this because diplomacy could bring, potentially could bring peace, it could bring down commodity prices, it could do a lot of things by engaging in diplomacy. <laughs> so so I, I, I have to say that, I have to say that. But I will say this about Kosovo specifically and Vasvia. I wrote a piece in, the, in uh, foreign policy in March with my colleague from Sarajevo, Hikmet Karsic, 
And we basically laid out the case for Kosovo that there is, in fact, uh, there is in fact a court on the Kosovo crimes, but the mandate is to just, uh, in fact, prosecute KLA leaders. However, my colleague at the uh, American University School of Law, Paul Williams, has suggested, and I think it makes a lot of sense, to expand the mandate of that court and to bring uh, together the, the trained staff to prosecute these rapes. It is reprehensible. And Dick Marty wrote that, that mandate, and the United States of America helps fund that court, and I do not see why, in view of what is going on in Ukraine, why the President of the United States cannot say, let's bring justice for all of these crimes, and let's expand the mandate of this court. So we suggest that this is perhaps the best opportunity because the court is actually operates locally and it operates in The Hague and it has the capacity to do this and we fund it and we support it. I would really like to see the members on the Hill that are supporting you and your colleagues and your all the women uh, on, the, on these crimes to say it's really time they had their day in court for every single one of them that wants to go and testify. This is, this is the, the place that could have jurisdiction. The other court that exists, as everyone knows, is the International Criminal Court. It's got a, uh, unfortunately, it has a weak mandate under the Rome Treaty in terms of enforcement, arresting those who may have committed crimes, they don't have an arrest capacity. But all that being said, it is simply outrageous that only one prosecution has happened in Kosovo itself. So I would say that given, as the, the ambassador did say, uh, there has been jurisprudence generated and it's through the courageous acts of Bosnian women and the Rwandan uh, survivors that actually created the international jurisprudence for the first time in the history of civilization to bring these, uh, to bring these cases to court, crimes against humanity, genocide, ethnic cleansing, enslavement, detainment. These are all charges that were used at the ICTI tribunal for Bosnian women and in the case of the Rwanda Tribunal, Akaseyu, who was a mayor of some local community, directed that rape be carried out against the Tutsis, and as a matter of fact, it was determined by that court that genocide was a component of genocide, and rape uh, actually played a role in the genocide. That did not happen at ICTI. So we do, we are aided by this jurisprudence, it exists, it just needs a court where it can rule. And that's one of the problems when it comes to sexual violence and conflict. This has been going on for a very, very long time. I actually just read a piece by a colleague about the pervasive rapes of Jewish women by the Third Reich and, of course, the Russians when they liberated the eastern part of Berlin. They liberated it. And raped over two million women. That is, that's actually not a crime that's talked about very much at all. So we are here today, uh, Vasfia, to stand with you because you are so courageous. And, and what I would like to see, the United States government, is to help support the, the instruments so that there's a court empowered to try these cases. And that's one of the problems that we face in international law is we have a paucity of courts. So I will leave my remarks there. And uh, I do this in solidarity with you and in the memory of my grandmother, who is from Albania. And I want to come out to all my B Albanian friends here that I am third generation. <laughs> Professor Delhi, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So we can have the framework and all the tools and the strategies that we like, 
but without the political will and some courage, they will not be adopted or implemented or enforced. So what are the obstacles to galvanizing political will, locally, nationally, mm -hmm. globally? How can they be overcome? And I open it to, to everyone. Go ahead. Oh. Well, I was going to say I'm very pleased by the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has been working on this issue uh, for quite some time. And they actually have taken some leadership on this issue. I, I uh, think that it is a matter of political will. And I would, like, I would like President Biden to acknowledge that there's rape going on in Ukraine. Let's not just call it war crimes. Let's call it for what it is. Let's break the silence on this horrific crime and talk about it and say, this should not stand. And I will go one step further. I want people to know, because I've been talking to some colleagues that are documenting this, they are doing more than raping Ukrainian women right now. They are going out of their way to make sure these women never have another child. It is really grotesque. So this is the time that the world leaders should stand up and say, we're not going to stand for this. And you will be brought for accountability for these acts. And we can do it through the UN. We can do it at Washington podiums, at London podiums, at Brussels podiums. We can do it all across this world. But we must speak out. And I'd like to see more elected officials address this head on. I fully agree with Professor Garmi. Um, if this is a matter of political will, but it's also a matter of using the mechanism that we have. One week after the uh, beginning of the aggression in Ukraine, Albania and 29 other countries asked specifically the ICC formally to open an investigation. And um, we could do so because Ukraine, although it's not a party to, to the Rome Statute, but they accepted the jurisdiction of the court. So that's one thing that we have already a mechanism of inquiry that is going there. A, a few weeks later, the Human Rights Council appointed a commission of inquiry composed of three persons, very knowledgeable and able uh, judges and, and professionals on the matter, and they are also about to produce a, a first report. The UN team is on the, on the ground. There are 45 people from different UN agencies that are on the ground, and they are documenting. We have the UN Women, we have the UNICEF, among other UN agencies, funds and programs who are on the ground and are documenting those crimes. Of course, it takes a little bit more time, but if we use smartly those mechanisms, if we gather facts, if we produce reports, and that's what UN does, but those reports can be extremely important because they, are, they can be a proof to be used uh, or at least to lead to um, gathering the proof to be used in court because that's the most important thing. We can have political will to improve things, but we have to use mechanisms. And, and this is exactly what, what the UN is engaged in doing, and we very much hope also to cooperate with the other element, which is the civil society, and where I would, I would of course, count on, on, on the photographers and the war photographers, on the, re on, on the reporting from the ground, on the different um, articles of in investigative journalism. So if we put all those together, which sometimes can be rushy and can be uncoordinated, but all these things in a life where we live with cameras and with doc um, documenting means. So we just have to be smart to provide all those data where they can be used, which is the court. Thank you very much. I do want to get to the whole issue of civil society and support for victims, but um, let's de delve a little more deeply before we leave the issue of accountability because clearly issues of impunity and lack of accountability are primary uh, concerns. And I wonder if we can take a look at some of the parallel measures that might be implemented um, in, a in addition to prosecution and punishment of war crimes um, that could um, deny the perpetrators the, the uh, capacity and the ability to inflict more harm um, that could leverage a credible threat, which would change the calculus of parties to conflict who've been operating under the assumption that they can get away with it and it is profitable if it's slave enslavement or tra uh, uh, trafficking or, or um, 
uh, or other uh, horrendous uh, tra trade in, in human beings. What else can be implemented together with it? We've heard of sanctions and arms embargoes and the like. Can you speak to some of the issues that would, would, inf would help to bolster the, the judicial track? Did you want to say something? Uh, I was just going to say one of the things that can be done, and um, in Europe specifically, where law enforcement has learned a lot from the Syrian war, and that these perpetrators that are being identified in real time can actually be put on an Interpol arrest, uh, arrest list and perhaps uh, make it very, very difficult for these people to travel, for example. And they could be arrested. And they, we, this actually began to develop because of the Syrian war. So law enforcement working hand in hand uh, with the courts, I mean, and knowing who's been indicted when charges are announced, uh, that would be an important step forward uh, from just a day-to-day -day action so that war criminals can't travel uh, around the world. They just should not have freedom of movement. So that's one of the things that could be actually applied to the situation. But with respect to victims, and this is very important in terms of justice, and I know that, Vasvia, you're involved in this, but the Global Fund uh, for se Sexual Violence Survivors actually has been really pushing reparations. And they delivered a preliminary report to the UN General Assembly a year ago, and they're delivering a final report this fall uh, during the annual meeting. And this is very important because what it does, it acknowledges that this person has been harmed and that they are deserving of reparations. Many of these people are quite poor, and many of them can't work, or they actually have, you know, persistent lifelong physical ailments as a consequence of their torture. Let's call it torture because that's actually what it is. Rape was determined to be torture. So, all I want to say is I think that that uh, reparations are imperative because victims. This is an acknowledgement by the state that this person has suffered this crime. And it's very important from, a, I think, a survivor standpoint. One, one, one little thing, and all these um, 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 measures that could be taken are absolutely right. And of course, they, they involve the political will. But I think we could also uh, see how we could improve, also we could use the, the abilities, the technologies that we have now. There has been talk in the UN to try to see, to have a registry. It's delicate because it's personal data. It's something that you cannot talk freely. It takes a lot of courage to really um, um, go out and, 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 and speak about, about these traumatic uh, events. Um, but I think that um, um, the more we, we, we try to connect between normative mechanisms and technology in trying to really shorten the time that we gather facts, because that's, um, that's the key aspect. The more facts that we have that can be used, that can be legally um, uh, used in, in court, the better it is. And of, co of course, um, I think there is a link between um, the, the, the amount of crimes that happen and impunity. They happen because the criminals, they know that they might, they have a fair chance to really uh, go away with crime. The more accountability, probably the lesser the crimes that can be committed because they know that now it is easier to document, it's easier to bring them to court, it's easier to prosecute them. So this is something that needs to be, to be, uh, to be thought as well and, and I'm sure that civil society can, can bring um, a, a powerful perspective as well. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm proud that we've been working with uh, Congress, with Vera Mieko, to have a resolution that hopefully will go into Foreign Affairs Committee soon and pass the House and the Senate, and it has to do with uh, sexual violence in uh, Kosovo and around the world. So, and that will help us hold Serbia accountable for those crimes they have committed, and that's a good step for us. Well May that go forward. With strength. Let's take a look at the 
the support that we could be giving those who have suffered this trauma. And we, we all know that the consequences of sexual violence and rape in war go far beyond individual suffering. Sexual violence committed against entire communities spreads diseases, destroys family ties, and inflicts harm over generations. It's not one person, it's not one generation. Moreover, sexual violence as a tactic of war reinforces gender inequalities, and it normalizes sexual violence even after the conflict has ended. So I'd like us to try and consider what ways we can implement a survivor-centric, trauma-informed approach to supporting the victims and the survivors and their families. The full range of services, as well as the retribution and the justice served. We owe you nothing less. Well, I, I think, you know, there are people here that are providing services. Um, and uh, it seems that if, in fact, reparations are awarded, that is part of the services. But psychosocial support, I, I think it's very, very important, obviously. And there's got to be a continuum of care. And that's got to come from, I believe, the government where these people live and the people who survived these crimes. I'm, I'm much more intimately familiar with what happened in Bosnia and what's followed it than I am with Kosovo. However, there, there seems to be never enough, and uh, there are good people working in Kosovo, there are good people working in Bosnia, and they continue to do this work, working with the families of survivors of these crimes. Um, so it's got to be a continuum of care, and that includes being in the justice process. And I, I speak about this in my foreign policy article about how the courts have to be staffed with psychologists and social workers, and lawyers need to be trained on how to interview uh, survivors so that they don't re-traumatize people. That's very, very, very important. Uh, and so a continuum of care I think lifelong care so that people can regain their stamina, their mental well-being, that they're able to participate in society. This is, in, is absolutely crucial, as well as uh, reparations so that perhaps they're, they are given enough money that they can actually live s with some decent quality of life. Um, but that has to be a commitment by the government of where uh, people are from. And th this is very well known in Kosovo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and to some extent also in Croatia. I subscribe to everything that you said, Professor Domi. Um, it's, it's support, support, support. That trauma, those persons will have that trauma for a long time. I don't know if it ever disappears, but everyone involved should try to make that disappear. And it can only be done by support, it can don be done by accompaniment, it can be done by compensation, but it can be done also by talking, by forming groups of persons that, that have been through similar experience. I think it would be healing um, in, in a more, I hope, rapid and quick way to really tell that account. I know telling it publicly is very painful, but probably telling it and talking about it in a, in a, in a, in a closer group or of, of, of persons who have been through the same um, uh, uh, painful experience might, might help. But, uh, but again, it can be uh, done um, locally, nationally, and internationally through um, the different mechanisms and compensation funds also um, that have been created on that purpose. I do know the, clo the Global Fund has made recommendations on this, and this will go to the UN General Assembly in uh, September, so it'll be very important to see what that final report looks like, and it's based on the survivors and what they actually need. So I think that'll be very important to highlight and think about. I'd like to turn to Marissa and, and to Vasvier, who've been 
speaking with so many women in so many different places. Um, I have heard recently from somebody who's actually been documenting evidence and providing a, an academic report that when he speaks to the women and says, what do you want most from us? The answer is, don't forget about us. Um, they want aid to the co their local communities, to give agency to the local communities. I'm, I'm, I'm looking here at Kadire, who's doing exactly that um, in, in Kosovo, to rebuild civil society and provide them with the direct support because they know what their communities need to rebuild. But from your perspective, from what you've seen and heard, how can we best help and what would be the most meaningful step that sends the loudest, strongest message and really provides material support? Well, it's very interesting what you just said because one of the women who is in the exhibition, Nuk Minni, who survived the Khmer Rouge genocide, um, I met her in Phnom Penh. Um, she was part of a delegation of uh, civilian witnesses at the first genocide tribunal to take place there in 30 years. This was in February of 2009. And um, I met her on the grounds of Tolslang Prison. And I don't know, I was quite drawn to her, and I, I asked if I could speak with her, and I met with her later. She'd never spoken to anyone before. It was her first time in Phnom Penh. Her father and brother were killed in the, in the, in the genocide. She lived with her mother. And at the end of trying to speak with her, my translator didn't show up, and so my taxi driver was my de facto translator. And at the end of it, she said, please don't forget us. So as I'm listening here, what I was thinking about is the Shoah Foundation. Uh, the Shoah Foundation has become this incredible place where hundreds, thousands of Holocaust survivors have had their testimonies of their experiences documented. Is there a way to create, let's say, a type of a Shoah Foundation for survivors of, international survivors, you know, that they can actually know that their testimonies are, their stories are told and their stories make a difference. You know, it's a collective. So, um, I mean, I, s a number of the women who I met over the years, I met a German woman who was a child during the war and um, I asked her to, you know, tell me her life story before the war and during the war. She spoke for six hours and I couldn't even take a photograph of her because she was so gone telling me her story. I could never actually connect with her. She kept bringing out ration cards and her <laughs> childhood notebooks. And it was like no one since the war ended had ever asked her to tell her story. And I've had enough therapy <laughs> sessions to know you just have to let somebody run. I mean, it was slightly exhausting. My poor translator after two hours, I just said, I can't. You know, but we knew enough to just let her speak, you know. And so, again, here's a story. She didn't have, she wasn't raped, but, you know, she was a child and she was traumatized. So everybody wants their story heard. So the question is, how do we safeguard these stories and then be able to use them to make a difference? I do want to give some credit to my colleague, um, Dr. Anna Delilio, who actually created the oral history project for Kosovo. And she did capture these stories. And as a matter of fact, to her great credit, that's how she began documenting rape, the rapes that, ki that, that actually occurred because people who were giving their oral testimonies started telling her this. Um, and I might add, this is really good to know, and Vera, I can talk to you about this too, is that the Srebrenica Memorial in Bosnia has now actually, um, in partnership with the Shoah Foundation, they are now doing oral testimonies of what happened, and they uh, have deposited the first ones. And so there's, there's reason to go to Jewish institutions because they know about this better than anyone. I mean, they have done such incredible work on memory. So I, I just want to throw that out, and I'm aware of it. One, one additional word 
um, um, you mentioned the um, SRG Bermuda pattern. Um, yeah. One one person that is uh, really um, specifically charged with these, these issues, and and her office produces those reports that go to the Security Council, and then Security Council holds a debate. Unfortunately, Kosovo has not been part of those reports, although uh, we um, we we tried and 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 asked and re-asked and and because of the neutrality of the of the action of of um, UN in Kosovo, they were not included in the report. But but. Sometimes things change slowly, but in a different way. And there is one publication of the office of the SRG, of the UNSRG, with testimonies, 150, and there are testimonies from, from, from Kosovo as well. So, of course, we need to document everything that is documentable, everything that can really tell a story. And, 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 and we should encourage more, because that's exactly, that goes in the very, the very same way to, if we, we can to really um, um, institute an institution where those stories are documented and shown, and, and they maintain that um, necessity of speaking about it, and, and, and promoting the good, good examples how um, um, support has been given and how uh, survival-centered approach has been applied. I'm wondering if education and real gender equity might alleviate the stigma of rape and actually make it safer for, for, for women to be able to give that, uh, that testimony. Uh, because there are still many, many that cannot come forward and, and are terrified uh, to speak and to share. Do you think that could make a difference? That could make a difference, but I'm going to speak on uh, Kosovo. It's, uh, the taboo there is so strong, it's very hard for women to share the story. Now they do share stories without their name or their faces showing up, but it's very difficult because of the family and the stigma that surrounds them. It's very difficult to come forward. I uh, spoke in Kosovo for the very first time in 2018, and so far we don't have another survivor to share their story with public because they just hesitate because they will be disowned by their family members. Uh, now Kosovo as a country, they did recognize us as uh, sexual violence survivors since 2014. We do have reparations, it's a pension form of pension that we get it uh, monthly. But I think the pensions should uh, come from Serbia because they're the ones that they did the damage, not my country. But my country was good, nice enough to have us a reparation. <laughs> The immortal well, words of the namesake of our organization, Simon Wiesenthal, who dedicated his life to pursue justice, not vengeance. Let the bar of history stand corrected. Let the real crimes be acknowledged, and not only for the sake of the past and those who have suffered, but more so for the sake of the future to prevent it going forward. I wonder if we can end just by asking each of you for a and you've given many, many recommendations. Where is this leadership going to come from in this country? What would you like to see as the very next step from each of your unique perspectives? Why is everybody looking at me? Um, well, I made very clear what I think should happen. I think the President of the United States should stand in the White House press room and say it. And I would like also to see Speaker Pelosi talk about this because she is the highest ranking member in Congress as the Speaker. Uh, and I'd like to see more collaborative work between the United States with the U United Kingdom and our colleagues in Europe. Uh, you know, the ambassadors talked about this quite a bit. Um, there is a lot of support for the ICC. There is a collaboration going on. But, and there is a prosecutor that's investigating and there's a prosecutor general in Ukraine who's cooperating with the ICC. That's very, very important. But political will is very, very, very key if we are ever going to end this reprehensible crime. And it's to say this is unacceptable, uh, that it continues with impunity, and we will come and find you. You will be arrested for these crimes. And so that's, that's really what it takes. And as you all know, because many of you came to the United States from Europe, you know the world pays attention to what the United States president says. That's, that's my best advice. Thank you.
Um, probably one additional thing, I mean, I would be cautious in before asking the United States here what they should do. I'm not an American citizen, and when we do that, we do that uh, at the UN. But I think the United States and all European countries and those countries who have um, um, the who have uh, established ju uh, judicial systems, they could use the universal jurisdiction to really prosecute individual cases in, in beyond what the international mechanisms that are um, created for that purpose. So I think uh, that would be also a very strong and powerful um, um, tool and, and weapon against that, that horrible weapon uh, as of sexual uh, violence and, and as, a, as a weapon of war. Basquiat, you've told us that you're about to head out again to Washington with a re real resolution. Is that what you're hoping for as the next step? What would you want to see happen next? Most definitely, that's a step I'm looking forward to because if we have United States support, I think we can achieve justice and we will be able to hold Serbia accountable for those crimes and to show the world that United States is standing on the right side of the history. So that's what I'm hoping for. I can't really add to that other than to say I, I agree with everyone and to just be compassionate, listen. If somebody wants to tell you their story, just listen with an open mind and an open heart. Congressman Engel, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I really would like for you to have the, the last word since you have been the one to try to galvanize political attention and political will for this really important issue. Let me give you a mic. Well, first of all, I wanna thank the, uh, the panelists. It was really, truly excellent, uh, all of you. This really was terrific. You know, the other day, I think it was the day before last, I turned on the, the TV. I've been watching a lot more TV, CNN, and some of the other stations because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and my family came from Ukraine, by the way. Um, it was, um, they interviewed two or three women who had been raped. And um, I, 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 I looked, at I re you re recoil at something like that because it's not something that you would expect to see. Uh, a woman was saying that she said to the guy who was raping her, uh, how, you know, how could you do this? Don't you have a conscience? And what's scarier to me is that it shows that very few people have consciences. I mean, you just intrinsically should know that rape is a, hor a horrible thing and no normal person would, would do it. And yet, I'm sure that in those soldiers, somehow or other, wars make people crazy and they become different people. Some of those people who raped were, were probably you know, good people in other, in a, in other ways uh, through the years. So it makes you wonder what is it in a war that brings out the worst in people. Uh, we had a hearing when I was chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee about rape in Kosovo. And uh, we had people actually coming and giving us all kinds of um, all, all kinds of information on what really happened. And what really struck me uh, how horrible rape is, is that other than lip service, what has the international community done? What have people done? We know, because I've been to Kosovo many times, that Justice has not been done in so many cases. The, the mass graves and the, uh, all the other things uh, are still there. The Balkan Wars was 1999. Uh, I was in Kosovo and uh, went to the houses after the the bomb the uh, the Serbs when the uh, when NATO was bombing. Um, the Serbs left and torched every house that they could see. I still have those, that album on my, on my jaw, uh, in my bedroom. So I think that we all, everybody in this room is, uh, is uh, of one mind when it comes to, uh, to rape and other atrocities. But I think the international community, frankly, should be ashamed of itself for the lack of movement. We have some people here whose whole families are wiped out. We have some people here whose brothers, the Batichi brothers, uh, and you go on and on and on, and you hear a lot of good lip service, but you don't hear more. So I want to thank the Simon Wiesenthal Center for doing this. Uh, I had the great
good fortune to meet him, uh, and uh, he was uh, a real, he, he was someone to be really admired. Um, and I want to thank the president also, of, uh, not the president of the United States, but the president. president um, is that your title? Director of the Museum. I want to thank you for letting us stay here. I want to thank you for your, your insight to everything you do. I want to thank you for all you do, and I want you to know you'll always have my support. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. I appreciate it. Much has been shared, said and, and shared in, in conclusion. We have to admit that it's an undeniable sad fact that sexual violence is a feature of armed conflicts around the world and often used as a strategy, but it is not inevitable. I'd like to give the last word to quote Dr. Dennis Mukwege, he's the renowned uh, cardio uh, the, a gynecologist from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who said, these crimes never happen accidentally. It is a choice to employ or tolerate them. Therefore, it can be stopped. Dr. Mokwege, of course, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018, <laughs> together with Yazidi survivor um, Nadia Murad. And together, as Professor Domi has already mentioned, they established the Global Survivors Fund to support survivors' demands for a world where sexual violence as a weapon of war is no longer tolerated and bears consequences for individual perpetrators and states. So following their mandate, let us all work for a future where survivors receive the holistic care and compensation they need to rebuild their lives, where we create opportunities for survivors to speak out and be heard, where they can organize to create change, influence policies, and demand justice and accountability. Like our special guests here on the panel and in the audience, let us all firmly resolve to commit to ending sexual and gender-based violence in conflict that continues to besiege women, children, and men from every corner of the globe. This grave violation of human rights imprints lasting trauma on its victims and not enough is done to prevent it when conflicts spark. We need to work on prevention, as you have said, and act immediately rather than waiting for official reports of rape or other forms of sexual violence in order to enact countermeasures. So we have a great deal of work to do. I would like to thank you, Ambassador Hoja, Professor Domi, Vasvia Krasniki Goodman, Mar Marissa Roth, Congressman uh, Elliot Engel, for your insights in a really enlightening and empowering conversation. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. Please use this extra time to come up and speak in person with all of our special uh, guests and take a moment to revisit uh, the exhibition before you leave. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Have a good night.